That's a funny movie if you're a sick bastard like I am. If I tried to do this for a Hollywood studio, well, it would never have made it to the screen. I love Twilight. And the one you get called the most is the psychopath auteur. Oh, wow. Hi, I know what you might be thinking. How will this video be any different to the dozens of other videos on this platform made by film bros about this movie? I thought you were just a nerd with a film degree haunted hippie. What are you gonna show me that I haven't seen before? I actually don't know because I haven't watched anyone else's video essays. Seemed like all the ones that popped up on my search page were made by dudes and that just didn't interest me. But this is not just gonna be like 30 minutes of me rambling about cultural subtext. I actually did my research. I watched the feature commentary, the making of. I tracked down every archival interview that I could find so that not only will I be spouting off my own opinions, but I will be including relevant interview insights as well. This will function both as a deep dive into the film and a review of the film itself. If that sounds good, I hope that you stick around, click subscribe, hand over your soul even. What? Yeah, give me your soul. This is my online virtual cult or coven, whatever you feel more comfortable with. My subscribers are my devoted little subjects. They're my little maggots. You could be the axe to my Patrick Bateman. <laughs> Engaging with the video also helps me out a ton, so don't be shy, babes. Also make sure to click the notification bell, that way you never miss our next meeting. In today's meeting, there will be a lot of spoilers for American Psycho because it is a deep dive after all. I'll need to pull context from the movie constantly, and so if you haven't seen the movie, I highly recommend that you go out and see it. Go watch Watch it and I will be right here waiting for you when you get back. All right, let's get into the story of American Psycho. First by diving into a bit of the background information on the novel, which was written by Brett Easton Ellis and it was released March 6th of 1991. At first he wanted to write a book about Wall Street set in New York and have it be fairly realistic. But I was hanging out with these young guys who were working on Wall Street and was doing research, having dinners with them, going to clubs with them, never being taken to their offices, never being taken to what was going on in their companies. And one night, while I just saw this parade of status one-upmanship, who has the best suit, who has the best house in the Hamptons, who has the hottest girlfriend, I suddenly, out of the blue, thought, Powder Beam's a serial killer. Imagine being part of an industry filled with so much soul rot and bullshit that Brett was like, mm -hmm, I could be surrounded by serial killers right now. It reminds me so much of that one clip of Robert Downey Jr. when he visited Wall Street in the early 90s. I have to play it because I just fear that not enough of you have seen it. If money is evil, then that building is hell. This is the most obnoxious group of money-hungry, low-IQ, high-energy, jackrabbit, fucking wannabe, big-time, small-time, shit-talking, bothersome, irritating bunch of motherfuckers I have ever had to endure for more than five minutes. Makes me laugh every time. I do have more to touch on with Brett. We will talk about the author and his insights more later, especially to answer the burning question of was it all in Patrick Bateman's head? But more on that later. First, I want to talk about the director and writer Mary Heron. Before she was approached, the first director asked to join the project was one David Cronenberg. De Palma was also considered, Johnny Depp had read the novel and he was really interested in making the movie. A lot of big names were swirling around. Stanley Kubrick, I think, was another one. But then the producers became aware of a movie called I Shot Andy Warhol. And it was the suggestion of producer Chris Hanley's wife that Mary Heron be hired to direct American Psycho. Mary Heron has an interesting perspective because despite growing up having a father in the industry, directing was something that she didn't really see herself being able to achieve. How did the idea of making a film at all first come to you? Well, you know, when I was growing up, there were no female film directors that I knew of. So it just never occurred to me that I could be a director. And, you know, as I was on a lot of shoots and it took me ages to get the chance, five years to get the chance to direct. And then I realized, actually, you just have to know what you want. And the director is the conductor of the orchestra. So then it was not, as, you know, then I thought, oh yeah, there's, I can do this. She talked about this in several interviews, just the lack of role models for her to look up to because women do not get equal opportunity in this industry. And several times she mentioned how the only female film director she had to look up to was Lenny Reifenstahl. Hard to see yourself making your way into the industry when the only woman you have to look up to was the director for Hitler. <laughs> We've come a long way since then, still not where we need to be, but it's gotten a lot better. She first read American Psycho the year that it came out and she was an instant fan. She understood immediately that it was a dark comedy, that it was a critique on society, but other women, not so much. This article is referencing kind of the body of work of Brett Easton Ellis. Upon its release, it was widely condemned as being too graphically violent, outright misogynistic, and got him labeled as a sadist. Petitions were signed to ban the controversial book, a contemptible piece of pornography, and Ellis was dropped by his then publishers, Simon & 
Schuster because of aesthetic differences. The controversy led to death threats, and American publishing house Alfred A. Knopf decided to release it as a paperback. There were protests by the National Organization for Women. They opened up a hotline, so over the phone, they would read some of the most graphically violent passages from the book, just doing the absolute most, which is wild because the book itself, not just the movie, takes this kind of postmodern stance. So I have to, you know, question the legitimacy of these feminists. It reminds me of a lot of the current scrutiny that Martin Scorsese finds himself under, where, you know, he puts the worst person in the world as the lead of his films, usually played by Leonardo DiCaprio. And yeah, we see things from their perspective, and yeah, there's a lot of debauchery that takes place in his films, but that's the point. The main character is the bad guy. Sometimes that really just kind of whoop for people, you know what I mean? Anyway, all of this feminist outrage kind of leaked into the making of the film. And then it was a very good idea to get a woman to do it, because I think it helped to neutralize some of the controversy. I think there were things that I thought were crystal clear in the book, that it was a critique of male behavior. The world just didn't see it that way, I guess. Literacy in unpacking subtext was still pretty low in the 90s. That goes along with a note that I often make about a lot of critics. If you're not going to at least consider the intentions of the filmmaker, then why are you reviewing their work? The bias is always so obvious and so ugly. Because let's consider who made American Psycho, the writers. Guinevere Turner, a lesbian who had just written Go Fish. I just found out about it and immediately put it on my watch list. It's a romance about two lesbians in Chicago. Guinevere Turner also plays Elizabeth in the movie. What a talent. And then Brett Easton Ellis also has a writing credit technically on the movie, but in all the behind the scenes and interviews and stuff, it sounds like it was Mary and Gwen that wrote the script. I think that Brett Easton Ellis has a writing credit on IMDb or something because he wrote the book, so obviously he has the story by credit. Anyways, we already talked about his intentions with the book, but Mary Heron, one of the leading writers of the script, she attributes her entire career to feminism. Well, I feel like um, if there was no feminism, I would not be making films. But then, you know, there were so many film directors, and, and I'm always asked, like, why aren't there more? It's like, well, when I was growing up, there was nobody, practically. And and look at, you know, Catherine Bigelow, Andrew Arnold, there's Lynn Ramsey, there's incredible, oh, Sarah Pauly. To me, actually, it's not so much having been uh, a woman director, but of, on my last two films, Notorious Betty Page and this one, I wanted to tell specifically female stories with women in the lead, and that will still be harder. So, and I respect the hell out of them for this, they really ignored all of that criticism and went ahead and made the movie anyways. We'll talk about the reception of the movie later, though, because that was a winding road. As was casting, the fact that Christian Bale was cast feels like a mini miracle when you look back at it. First, when he was even just considering the role, people were telling him, oh, this is career suicide. You'll only be typecast as villains from now on. Luckily, he didn't pay that any mind because he never viewed Bateman as a villain. Not for the reason that you think, though. It was because he found the character so ridiculous and he also understood the material. He was like, we're laughing at him the whole time. You're never laughing with him. And you'd be so surprised to hear whose head that flies right over. When there still was the Wall Street uh, trading floors and everything. I went and visited, you know, all different levels of people at Wall Street, but the guys on the trading floor, when I arrived there before making the film, I got there and a bunch of them, they were going, oh, Patrick Bateman, and patting me on the back and going, oh yeah, we love him. And I was like, yeah, ironically, right? And they were like, what do you mean? So it was always worrying. Clearly, look, it's a satire on capitalism in the 80s. Shall I survey the audience? Are we surprised? Are we surprised? No. People whose only motivation is money will damn any other life pursuit unless it helps them achieve wealth and status. Including critical thinking. This movie is in the business of exposing that elitist bullshit. Especially in moments like the famous business card scene. We know this scene, right? Even if you haven't seen the movie, you've probably seen the memes. Picked them up from the printers yesterday. It's very cool, Bateman. This, of course, is one of my favorite scenes in the movie because it's kind of trying to expose the obsession with even the minutia of status. The fact that one card is bone wide, another is eggshell or whatever, and Bateman actually breaks a sweat with the stress of it all. And the people at Sundance didn't laugh? Oh wait, we haven't talked about that yet. <laughs> More on that later. Did you know that Christian Bale could actually make himself break a sweat on cue? Fun fact. Anyways, I went to private school for college, and the male bravado you see at midnight at a water polo team party, let me tell you. I would go on record and estimate that about 50% of those guys developed an alcohol addiction just to impress the boys. The status of being able to drink the most, to sleep with certain girls, to be able to 
to fuck around their entire college career because whether or not they graduate, daddy will give them a job at the company no matter what. If you couldn't tell, fucking nerd over here. Ever a perpetual student, still writing video essays on YouTube. Those guys and others that come from money or whatever, with no regard for education and their health, only had the sole interest in instant gratification. And yes, they were all severely addicted to their vapes. All in the name of chasing male validation. I mean, can you say gay? Anyways, Patrick Bateman is the exaggerated, hilarious, worst case scenario version of all those men that I have met. And he almost wasn't played by Christian Bale. Leo DiCaprio was originally the front runner for the position, which Mary Heron was vehemently against. In the From Book to Screen featurette that you can find on the 4K, she talks about the fact that you can't take the love interest from Titanic and then throw him into her dark script. It would have had to be rewritten and it would have ended up not aligning with her vision at all. She stuck to her guns so much, in fact, that she left the project. This is after she'd auditioned Christian. She really wanted him for the role, but it was a tough sell. She couldn't really convince the producers. But Christian understood the vision. He understood that the character didn't need to be changed, didn't need to be given a psychological backstory or motivation, and he didn't give up. She really put herself on the line, you know, and I, I so appreciate that because she had so many known actors who, who were stepping up and wanted to do it. And she just said, no, I want Christian, even though all the financiers were saying, we're going to give you no money. And then actually kicked the two of us off. Uh, you know, we went and we did a stage reading in New York for it. Uh, Willem Dafoe was there, Chloe Sevigny was there, and uh, Brace and Ellis was there. And then we got the money, yay! But what our agents forgot to do our agents at the time, forgot to do was to include us in the package. And so we raised the money and then they said, right, and the two of you, bye-bye. I went a little bit psycho myself in that, in that I just said, nah, no, I'm still making the film. And even though other people were cast, other directors were on board, I just kept on prepping. And I would call Mary up and she would say, Christian, they've given it to other people. And I was like, yeah, 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 no, it doesn't matter. We're still gonna make it. And she was like, ooh, he's lost the plot. This was a really hard time for Mary, she says, maybe the worst time of her career. At one point, Oliver Stone was attached to direct with Leo DiCaprio set to star, and they even auditioned Cameron Diaz. Apparently, according to Guinevere Turner, what made this all turn around is the fact that Gloria Steinem sat down with Leo DiCaprio and told him that he couldn't star in this movie because his fans at that time were all 13 year old girls who would turn against him. And we all know how much he loves his young fans. Low hanging fruit, I'm sorry. Anyway, however the dominoes fell, it all worked out for the best because I could not envision anyone else as Patrick Bateman. Christian Bale was so dedicated. Mary said that, oh, you know, you look a little bit skinny. Maybe you should hit the gym before we start rolling. So he did in a matter of weeks, he put on a ton of muscle. He went on this super high protein diet, got into not only the mind, but the body of Patrick Bateman. He kept the book next to him at all times on set so he could refer to the material. And he was constantly adding these unique quirks to the character that we wouldn't have gotten had he not been played by Christian Bale. For example, he improvised putting the coaster under the water glass in this scene to play into the controlling OCD nature of the character. Oh, but my favorite fun fact about that scene is that Mary had Willem Dafoe play the scene in several different ways. She had him play it as though he thought that Patrick was guilty, as though he thought that he were innocent, and as as though he didn't know. And they would cut between different versions of the scene to keep it uneven, which I found very effective. I remember being really confused on my first watch of this movie, just not being able to figure out this investigator's intentions. It's really this emotional roller coaster where you can't tell where his head is at. But anyways, more fun touches by Christian Bale. He had read some old Playboy magazines or something from the 80s, and he found this article about men at his best. He and Mary had also come up with this theory that he watched videotapes of things to kind of learn how to do human things. For example, by watching porn to learn about sex. So he came up with his character taking inspiration from the Playboy magazine to set up a really proper date. When he invites the escorts over, he's dressed up in a tux, he's offering beverages, very formal. That is also a scene that you just get this undeniable feeling that a woman directed it because it's so awkward. These women are not framed through the male gaze. They look uncomfortable because Bateman is a weirdo. The camera isn't going up and down her body as she's dancing. You can see her face, which is very awkward, and we get a wide shot of the whole awkward picture. Mary Heron said in the director's commentary that she really wanted to stress the fact that these women were just here doing their job. They didn't want to be here. I think that given the trends of the early 2000s especially, if a man had directed this in 1999, these women probably would have been a lot more objectified. But this is where I'm talking about with people not paying attention to the intentions of the filmmaker. Did the people outraged about this movie and the graphic deaths of these women even pay attention to how these women were framed? Did they take notice that there wasn't really any type of objectification going on that we got 
got to read a lot of the women's emotions in this scene? I don't know. I don't think so. On that note, though, you might notice that most of the women in this movie really only have one dimension to them. Pretty much every woman except for Christy, maybe, is one note, very shallow. Christy gets to be the audience surrogate sometimes, so we kind of react to things with her, but that's about it. But his secretary, Jean, she's just this timid thing that answers to Bateman's every whim. Courtney is just this drugged up nothing burger of a person. In my opinion, that comes off like a very deliberate attempt to convey how men like Patrick Bateman view women. Each woman has her function in how she serves him. One note, not complete beings. There's also the more obvious scene where he's with his buddies and they're just kind of laughing about, oh, a woman can't be attractive and talented. <laughs> That's a little more explicit. So maybe you already picked up on the other subtext I was talking about. In terms of other moments that were uniquely Christian Bale created during his final confession on the phone, Mary said that he had probably about 10 cappuccinos between takes to get himself all hopped up. She ended up starting the scene with his first take and ended the scene with his last to really capture the progression of his madness. We all know that Christian Bale loves some method acting, but I don't know how he didn't poop his pants while shooting that. Anyway, now that we're on to the end of the movie, I say that we get into the age old debate. Was it all happening inside of Patrick Bateman's head? What does haunted hippie think? But hold on, this all ties in, but I have other theories first. You know how he goes to Paul Allen's place and suddenly it's spotless and it starts to thinking that, oh, okay, maybe this was all really in his head. I am not the only one that argues that there is enough evidence to suggest that it happened in real life. If we're going along with the social satire nature of this story, let's think about who we're critiquing in this scene. Throughout the movie, they are making a criticism of elitist society, and who is involved in that? Realtors. What was stopping that realtor from chasing a sale? You think she would have an easy time selling it to another Manhattanite if they knew that a bunch of grisly murders had taken place there? No, 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 she would have had it sweeped. She knows how to stage a home. But you might be thinking, wait, then he confesses to his lawyer, who <laughs> like mixes him up with some other dweeb in the office. I'm Patrick Bateman. Because it's true, all those men are the same. There's no individualism under capitalism, baby. And what a good running joke that was. Oh, I loved it. Everyone mixing everyone up, especially the poor security guard he shoots. I cackle. I'm not gonna hold you. My sense of humor is a bit fucked. Sorry, sidetracked. You might be thinking about the end where he tries to confess and the lawyer is like, that's not funny. I had dinner with Paul Allen in London. Listen, a lawyer with that many high profile clients that keep him on retainer, you think he wants them to see him get caught up in a serial murder case? He can't risk his career like that. He doesn't want to be dropped by all those clients. Of course he's going to cover up for Bateman if it means he gets to maintain his status. That's what the whole movie is about. Bateman can't even confess and break up with his fiance because she's like, well, but we have the same friends. I really don't think it would work. Who cares about love when we made it to this social circle, baby? That's right, I'm on team reality and guess who else is? Well, the one thing I think I, is a failure on my part. People keep coming out of this film thinking that it's all a dream and I never intended it. I want, all I wanted was it to be ambiguous in the way that the book was. Why did they think that? I think it's a failing of mine in, in, in the final scene that I, I just got the emphasis wrong because I should have left it just more open-ended. I guess clearly, because people keep saying this to me, it makes it look like it, my, all, it was all in his head and it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's not. The director's on my side. The director's on my side. But even if she wasn't, it pretty much doesn't even matter if it was all a dream. When I was working on it, the three years I was working on it, I didn't know. I had no idea. I went back, I went forth, I went back and forth, I went back and forth. And it wasn't interesting to me to answer that. It was a much more interesting book without that being answered. And that, it really drove me to write that book without knowing that answer, without knowing whether this was true about Patrick or not. Sometimes I thought it was real and I wrote it that way. And then other times I realized that couldn't have been real. But then I'd get a little bit further on and go, well, that could have been real. There you have it, folks. Even the author of the book does not know because that's actually not what matters at all. The point is delving into the perspective of white male power, Reagan's America, and the destructive nature of it. The point of the film is the social criticisms that were so on point I had no choice but to laugh. It's one of the funniest movies I've ever seen in my life, probably the best satire ever made. Even funnier when you know that Wall Street bros love the character of Patrick Bateman because he's such a loser. God, I love this movie and it took me until my second viewing to really appreciate it. The first time around I didn't quite grasp what was going on and neither did a lot of people. The reception to this movie, like I said, was very hairy. The initial reaction to American Psycho, you know, a lot of it was very hostile. It indeed was, was I don't think considered a success when it first came out and now it's you know I'm always amazed at how how it's been reclassified as this film that, that everybody seems to love it's like what didn't everybody hate it you know 10 years ago it's one of those classics like The Thing or The Shining that people just didn't really get the first time around except for a select few on the director's commentary Mary Heron talks about the premiere screening at Sundance she said that she and the crew were laughing hysterically at the movie but the rest of the audience was silent because she guessed that they didn't really know if they were supposed to laugh for the rest of her time at the festival, 
people in the hotel or just walking around. She would kind of eavesdrop on people and hear them talking about how much they hated the movie. One very important person did receive the movie positively, though. Damn it, let's get <laughs> That's what everyone wants to know. Yes, I like the yeah. movie, I know. I think it clarified the themes of the novel. It clarified that the novel was actually a critique of male behavior. I think a lot of people don't realize that, uh, who haven't read the book. And so it clarified that and also brought the humor of the book up to the surface. I think the author loving the film is one way to know that you've done something right. Everyone who made the movie was on the same page. It just took a little while for everyone else to catch up. Much to my surprise, though, a famous critic who is usually very tough on movies, Roger Ebert, had some pretty positive things to say. It's just as well a woman directed American Psycho. She's transformed a novel about bloodlust into a movie about men's vanity. A male director might have thought Patrick Bateman, the hero of American Psycho, was a serial killer because of psychological twists. But Mary Heron sees him as a guy who's prey to the usual male drives and compulsions. He just acts out a little more. Look, the girls that get it, get it. Maybe you noticed, in the movie, we never see anyone conducting any actual business. They're just out at bars and restaurants all the time. There's a throwaway line about how Patrick's dad basically owns the company and him and all these other dudes are vice presidents. So their dads are also probably the board of advisors or something. What do men with that much money and power and status do with their time when they don't actually have sh to do? Everything becomes a competition, a vanity affair, a power play. Hence why so many people, especially women, became these disposable pawns to Bateman. Why even the slightest difference in the font on a business card caused him to break out in a sweat. When Bateman kills, it's not with the zeal of a villain from a slasher movie, it is with the thoroughness of a hobbyist. Lives could have been saved if instead of living in a high rise, Bateman had been supplied with a basement, a workbench, and a lot of nails to pound. His point that I agree with is that Bateman is sort of the natural conclusion to his environment. Unchecked male privilege is a cancer in this society, it's why we have capitalism. And yet the world still moves for those men, as demonstrated in the movie. I was surprised to find the New York Times had posted a positive review when this came out in 2000. Watching American Psycho is like witnessing a bravura sleight of hand feat. In adapting Brett Easton Ellis's turgid, gory 1991 novel to the screen, the director Mary Heron has boiled a bloated stew of brand names and butchery into a lean and mean horror comedy classic. The transformation is so surprising that when the movie's over, it feels as though you've just seen a magician pulling a dancing rabbit out of a top hat. Like I said though, the movie only had a cult following at first. There were only a handful of critics that really got it. From a budget of seven million, it grossed 34.3 million in the box office, so definitely considered a success. The vitriol the filmmakers received during, I guess, that first year of its release sounds pretty horrendous. I remember somebody threatening me on the street because some people did object to the film getting made and all that, and I remember people saying that they were going to do me harm and stuff like that, you know. And I would actually go like, I remember somebody, somebody warned me. It must have been a friend of mine who was crazy early on the internet, and they warned me. They called me up and they went, "There's some person, and they know where you walk every single day, and you go down this back alley, and they say that they're going to jump on you and they're going to rip your cerebral cortex out of your head. So please don't go down that alley." So of course I was like, "I'm going to that alley. I want to see what happens." And unfortunately, nothing. I kept walking up and down it. Going, where are they? Come on. What's <laughs> but nothing ever happened. Imagine seeing Christian Bale on the street and being mad. I'd be like, <laughs> Anyways, it even still has only a 68% on Rotten Tomatoes, but obviously the audience score is what matters and that's much better. Similarly on Letterboxd, it has a 3.9, on IMDb it has a 7.6. No matter which way you slice it, no matter how intelligent the satire of a movie can be, if you put some gory, bloody deaths in it, some critics are just never gonna be on board with that. Since its debut nearly 24 years ago, it's become considered one of the all-time greats. It hit the zeitgeist big, even returning some odd years ago with all of the memes popping up and new generations finding it. You notice American Psycho has become like a meme on... Oh, I noticed, started noticing this, this a few years ago. People started sending me um, links. And I have to say, I'm very grateful to it because it, it really kept the film alive and got it a whole new audience. There are some fantastic parodies. They're almost all good. I'm grateful for all the memes. I'm not precious about it. I'm, I'm grateful. If it amuses people, if it, it sparks anything in them, Thank you. I finally appreciate the movie for what it is. It took me long enough, especially considering the Trump era that I feel like we are still living through, where we literally had a Patrick Bateman in the Oval fucking office. Mary Heron actually made that connection in her commentary. She said the movie is more relevant than ever. She made the commentary for the 4K in 2018. So of course, at that time he was still in office. And speaking of, I'm so excited to explore more of her filmography. Same with Christian Bale. I really think he might be the best actor of his generation. The fact that they got no nominations or awards 
for this film. It makes me sick, especially because he was only 25 in American Psycho. I'll be 25 next year. I feel like a child, like a little baby person. I just had to talk about this film because sometimes when something finally clicks, you just can't shut up about it. Had to get this all off my chest. I hope I added something new to the conversation. Like I said, I don't consume film bro content, so you'll have to let me know. But that's gonna do it for my mini dive into American Psycho. But Kylie, there's a sequel. Aren't you gonna nope? No, there's not. There really isn't. The sequel with Mila Kunis, it's not even connected to the original story. Somebody wrote a script and then an exec was like, you know, that kind of sounds a little bit like American Psycho. And then some other dumbass exec was like, yo, we can just call this American Psycho 2. Way more people will come see it. And I don't know if that was the case. I don't know. I don't care to find out. I will never be watching that, but thank you. Anyways, let's take a gander over at these names scrolling on screen. These are my wonderful patrons. They keep the lights on at Haunted Hippie Studios, which the lights might have looked a little different today. That's because I'm visiting my parents. So every once in a while I do shoot a video in this location. I don't have my nice great video maker lights with me. So I couldn't do anything all colorful today, which is just as well because a lot of the lighting in American Psycho is like very fluorescent office lighting vibes. Anyways, the patrons, they get bonus content over there for supporting me. For example, sometimes I review new releases over there that I don't feel like giving, you know, full in-depth reviews on my main channel. I did a franchise ranking of Hell House LLC recently. Recently, I reacted to the Terrifier 3 drama over there as well. Just a lot of fun stuff. It's always different. I'm always shaking things up over there. So for every main channel video, you will get a Patreon video as well. And once a week, I also post to my vlog channel. You can find everything linked down below. My vlog channel is mostly where I talk about physical media, but I do also go on spooky outings every once in a while. That's three videos a week coming from me. So if you haven't subscribed yet, I mean, what are you doing? Make sure you click the notification bell so you never miss my next video. Subscribe to the vlog channel as well. Find me on my horror Instagram. I'm making content all over the place. But more than anything, I just hope that you enjoyed this video and that I catch you in the next one. Bye.